This is Startup Storefront. The state of California is in a housing crisis. And to meet the demand, the state needs to build 310,000 homes every year for the next eight years. However, between the high cost of land, labor, and materials, this is a serious problem with no easy solution. So our guest today, Gene Eidelman, began to analyze this issue at a high level and started to ask himself, why not use 3D printers to create the homes instead? Azure creates prefab units that are built 70% faster and 30% less expensive than traditionally constructed units, all while using recycled materials. They can be used as backyard studios, offices, and up to five units can be stacked together. In this episode, we discuss with Gene about how these can be used to help with the homeless crisis, how their early adopters were glamping retreats, and why Gene finds strength in coming from an immigrant community. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Gene, the founder of Azure. Thanks for joining. Sure. For people who don't know, what does your company do? So we 3D print uh, homes mm-hmm. using recycled plastic. And we are a startup yeah. about to start shipping our first units. What I love about the problem you're trying to solve is obviously it's front and center, specifically here in L.A., right? There's a huge unhoused population. As a developer, I always say the problem is not... In, in that the spirit of trying to solve the problem. The problem is not in the city trying to expedite permits. You know, the problem has always been, can you get construction costs down? That's, that's always been the problem. And the answer to that is it's very difficult to do that. Yeah. And so what you're doing is literally, you're literally doing that. Right. And then when you started attacking the problem, what was at least your first step or how did you view it as, okay, is it the materials? Like what's the thing that sort of changes the equation? Yeah, actually, back to the problem. It, it's how to do it faster, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how Time. to do it less expensive. Mm-hmm. And the third thing that really bothered me, I've been developing construction pretty much my whole life, is the way, the amount of waste that construction generates, all the environmental impact. Uh, but back to, your, back to your question, in terms of how we thought about doing this, we just knew that it's not going to be just a marginal improvement. You know, it's not like doing one trade faster or getting more qualified employees. We had to just think of how to shift the whole conversation. And we started seeing a lot of 3D printing using cement. So that started uh, just about the time we were starting the company. So we love the concept of 3D printing, right? But what we didn't like doing with cement was, A, terrible for the environment, I mean, Cement generates more CO2 than any other construction material. And two is when you do cement, you have a lot of stoppages due to weather, rain, too hot, too cold. So it, it really, yeah, it solved maybe the problem. <laughs> the weather is nice, you can build the walls faster, but it really didn't solve the whole thing. So we just uh, said, why can't we 3D print using... Uh, plastic and then recycle plastic, and why can't we do it in the factory? Um, doing it in the factory is much faster, much better quality it's control. contained, controlled, right, exactly. Yeah, and then doing it recycle plastic, you achieve the cost savings, uh, because now, basically in that process of, uh, we, we print the entire structure, so there is no wood, there is no metal, there is no roof, there is no waterproofing necessary, so, it structurally just changes the whole conversation of this is a way to reduce cost, do it much faster, and then environmentally we are actually positive environmental impact. It takes over 100,000 uh, recycled, you know, uh, empty water bottles to print one of our structures. Uh, wow. So the thing that always gets me about what you're working on is I always go, okay, if it were me, what would I think of solving the problem? And so the first part I, I would I would personally get stuck at is, Where do I even get a 3D printer? You know, does it even exist? Like we see it on YouTube, we'll see it, we'll read about it in the news, but it's like, how do I, how do I, if I was trying to attack the space, how do you get into that? Like, are they readily available? Is it pretty straightforward? Or like, what's the process there? Yeah, you know, I think in this respect, (laughs) it benefited us that we had a lot of time during COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Normal conditions, you probably wouldn't have because we're just so busy as contractors. But during COVID, we just, exactly to your point, it's like, all right, this simple concept, we're the 3D printers. And so we started looking at, and uh, 
uh, we realize that there are some 3D printers made in Europe. They're not easily available. There are some technologies being developed here that's proprietary that you don't know how they do it. So we literally spent a year looking for how do we get a printer? And our conclusion was there is no off-the-shelf solution. <laughs> we have to basically build the stack. <laughs> you know, we have to take a robot from one place, extruder, which is a piece that melts the plastic from another place, and then build a platform on how to build it. So we literally, just like people build software and they're taking you know, yeah. different pieces, we, that's how we ended up doing it. Okay. And then in terms of material. Yeah, where do you source that? You know, not only kind of where do you source it, but what do you source? Yeah. We've printed uh, last year two models. And so now we're starting production now. We're in the third set of material because okay. initially the material that was offered to us was something off the shelf that is used in a lot of automotive and our space type industries. So it's, it has recycled plastic. It has some of the components that we had. And so on one hand, it sounded, yeah, it seems like that might work. But when we put it into practice and we started, you know, printing, the, the unique part of what we do is we print very large structures. So 3D printing used extensively in many, many fields, but it kind of starts out with small printers, small parts, you know, medicine. But when you start printing um, big structures, you don't necessarily need the precision mm -hmm. that's required for smaller parts. But you need rigidity. You know? Yeah, it's got to. You got to be sustaining the the weights. Yeah. The weights, the being able to be comply with seismic requirements, uh, mm. hurricane winds, mm. um, snow loads. So so, mm. uh, and then just the whole process of printing. When you print large structures, it's amazing how the the composition of material affects this layer, what they call layer speed, <laughs> because the printers can actually print very fast wow. but you need to have a right balance of the material because right because it's hot maybe yeah yeah material gotta... needs to be in the, on one hand it cannot be totally you know first layer cannot be totally dry when the next layer go, goes on on the other hand and it cannot be totally liquid because then the next layer will not stick so it's that it's really is just a fine balance and it's pretty fascinating of uh, yeah anyway so a lot of it is just uh, trial and error I mean, uh, we're in the third material, and we're really, really happy with it because, A, it prints much nicer, and we've now accelerated the speed of how quickly we can print by about a third from our first, uh, from our first model. And were you, were you funding this yourself, or did you go raise some capital while you're sort of in development? Yeah. So initially, we funded it ourselves. Okay. It was so new. Yeah, investors love innovation, but investors don't like, like, totally... Most common question, why hasn't it been done before? Right, right. right. It must <laughs> so, be dumb if no one's done it it's before. It's either dumb or impossible, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so initially, for the first uh, year and a half, we had to do it ourselves, you know? Okay. It, it really is. I mean, in the, mor you know, in the morning, you're all enthusiastic, right, to do it. Towards the end of the day, you say, oh, my goodness, what are we getting into, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and that's how it is every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you deal with it? What's your What's your secret of dealing with it? Um, or do you do you enjoy? It? Do you view it maybe as like a game? No, it really is not a game because <laughs> okay, <laughs> you still have money on the line, right? Yeah. Um, it, the way to to deal with it, you know, I've started several businesses before, is to have a good support system among the, okay. yeah, you know, it, it's the family and friends and your business partner that makes it manageable. Okay. So it, you kind of. Entrepreneurs by nature are optimistic and enthusiastic, mm -hmm. but when you have doubts, you want to have people around you who will say, you know, you're, you always come up with a solution. You're going to think about it. And so, uh, and quite honestly, again, I'm come from, we're immigrants, refugees to this country and kind of immigrant community. Mm -hmm. I, I always, I, I often think that it's really kind of helpful because yeah. In the immigrant community, it's not just my immediate family, my brother, you know, my, my parents, but but it's more of a friends who are yeah. like your long lifetime friends, yeah. who just believe in you mm -hmm. and 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 don't accept that 
yeah. Don't ask the question why it hasn't been done before. It's like, yeah, yeah. They just go, you'll figure it out. They know. You'll figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. You'll figure it out is the most common. I hate it. I hate that though. I get that. They're like, you'll figure it out. And I'm like, I know, but I hate that because it's, <laughs> cause it's like, I have, that means I am aware of the pain I have to go through <laughs> and I'll figure it out no matter what, but there's still pain or annoyance or whatever. Yeah. You know, I think with, with time, you kind of learn that if you're just going to stick with it, the most important thing is to show up the next morning. You know, yeah, it's, it's amazing how every time at the end of the day when you say, gosh, I don't know how it's going to work or how to solve it. When you show up, to, for me, it actually works showing up early in the next morning you know, before yeah. all the activity. Yeah. It's just amazing how you, know, you sleep on it, you think about it, mm-hmm. even subconsciously. I, I sleep very well, so I know I'm not kind of on the one hand, I don't think I'm thinking about it at night, but on the other hand, it's yeah. amazing where all those ideas came from That's, in the morning. I think for me, I, I, it's weird where I'll go to bed, I'll try not to think about it, but then I'll solve it in my sleep or I'll, yeah. or I'll de- derive some thing, whether it's a new way of looking at it or, or just like a personal like, oh, I, I got this and this is how I'm going to do it. It's, it's weird, but I do it in my sleep and then I wake up either very motivated yeah. or, or terrified, right? It's, it's <laughs> same here. <laughs> but, but. No, it, it's kind of it's amazing weird. how... You can go to bed just thinking it's not going to work or don't know how to do it. And then the next morning, uh, I have a terrific business partner and he is also also immigrant and kind of all, also very positive type person. And we get, we'll get together in the morning. It's like, <laughs> this is easy. Right? Yeah. My heaven out of this. <laughs> yeah. The thing for me I always think about too is my mom came to this country with, with two kids and didn't know the language. And so... I always just tell myself, I'll never have that problem, right? And I would say that problem is probably the hardest problem to give any human. No plan, just a one-way ticket, two little kids, and they have to figure that out. And so that's another thing I tell myself when it gets rough. It's like, oh, well, I'll never have that problem. So I'm I'm in the bonus to some extent. Yeah. Knock on wood, we never know. But theoretically, that problem will never emerge. All right, so then then you figure out the printing component, the printing side of it, and then I imagine at this time – there's so many companies doing it, which is almost a good thing because then there's a lot of energy in the space. There's a lot of different takes. It creates some credibility as it relates to printing or modular in general, or just, wow, there's a lot of people attacking the problem. From your perspective, did you ever want to focus on, I know you do ADUs is the thing that's on your website, but when you were sort of thinking about the direction to go in, did you consider other avenues or was ADU the the one that was like the simplest? So... We actually started thinking about them as homes. You know, that's what we started thinking about them because that's where homes or even apartments. Mm-hmm. I have a nephew who actually was on your show a yeah. few weeks ago. And we Modern sat down. Modern animal. Shout out to Steven. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we sat down with him and showed him the business plan. <laughs> he said, he said, you got to start a lot simpler. <laughs> your go to market strategy got to be a lot simpler. Okay. And we said, yeah, we do a lot of these backyard studios. They were like 120 square feet. They didn't require a permit. He said, that, 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 go with that. <laughs> so we simplified the business plan after that one uh, got together for, for coffee in Stephen's house. There's so many questions on, I mean, we mentioned printer and material. How do you permit something, a new product? You know, how do you get approvals? And so making it a lot simpler and just much, much more kind of narrow and deep, right? Yeah. Sheds don't require permits. So anything under 20 square feet, you can, in front, you can go to Home Depot. In front of Home Depot, there are sheds. Right. right. Nobody requires buy one. permits. Yeah. Right. right. So, so we really kind of said, all right, we'll start with this, a shed. Uh, we've also done lots of ADUs. So the next the next level is ADUs. But ultimately, we're going to go vertical and we're going to do apartments and homes and we already are selling homes. So that's kind of how it started. Um, And amazingly, it's kind of, everybody gets, you know, especially during COVID, again, people understood very easily, yeah, I need an office. You know, so there are no interruptions from kids and family and dogs. (laughs) I can have a conversation. Right, you need your own room. Yeah, and so that's kind of, so initially uh, the people, I also just, it's amazing how many people think about 
how many early adopters in real estate? Because kind of many people get real estate, right? <laughs> yeah, and so people said, all right, how about an art studio? Yeah, how about a music studio? <laughs> That's a good, good yeah. <laughs> uh, how about just an exercise room or, or just a place to yoga or just to think? <laughs> so, so many, many, I mean, kind of in our mind, it was, all right, that's going to be a backyard office, but people just take that idea and run with it, right? And then, uh, as you said, on, on our website, we put ADUs. Uh, with ADUs, again, kind of what you think about, again, during COVID, it was like, I want to have a place in the back for maybe a family member, or elderly, or uh, uh, adult kids who are coming back. Uh, but having is a rental income. And for people listening, how much are one of the, what's the price you have this thing down to now? Square footage and then price. Yeah, for the small 10 by 12 studio, it starts at 26.9. That's crazy, uh, yeah. It, and it looks beautiful, as you saw. It's yeah. very practical. You got the tour of the studio, the, the, whole, the whole lab, the factory. Really, really special, really amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just to give people, in terms of like if I were, if I were to build uh, in a stick environment, wood framing, all that good stuff, how much would that cost compared? Yeah, no, we, we've built a number of them, yeah. both from scratch and from companies that prefab them. The same thing would be about thirty-five thousand dollars. So for so it's about thirty percent less expensive, yeah. uh, and it's like you would never know that it's less expensive. Yeah. Um, so our initial use, our early adopters were people who saw all kind of ideas of what to use this, what we saw just an office, what kind of use this is for. But then, uh, when as we got more and more publicity. We did not expect, just to be honest, was many of our initial customers are glamping resorts. Glamping, so, okay. Glamping, yeah. So oh. it's industry that's it's, it's growing tremendously right now. Yeah. And our first two customers, large customers, are getting this. You know, they have beautiful properties in the nature. And they're just putting these down. And they're putting them down. We have one who bought 24 of these. Yeah. Uh, one has one beautiful setting. Uh, so that, that's an industry. I'm not a glamper. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Me neither. I like. prefer a nice hotel, right, when you yeah. go on vacation. But now I'm kind of excited to go yeah. stay in one of our places because you, you, you can just drive and have, be in, in the nature yeah. and have a very comfortable, kind of luxurious unit to stay in. And it's also made from recycled plastic. You feel good about, about that. Any other cool examples? Uh, the glamping one's interesting. That one's pretty cool. The way I think about real estate, and I've been thinking about this recently because pickleball is like this new craze. You know, everyone's playing pickleball. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about pickleball is it's roughly 1,800 square feet for, you know, just the, the, the court itself. And to, to basically stripe and maybe add a little civil work to it, it's like maybe 40 grand. That's the cost, maybe 40 grand. And what's interesting about that, though, is that that forty grand can net you something like six to eight thousand dollars a month in income just from people paying to play something like fifteen to twenty dollars an hour, right. and just because of the popularity of the sport. So as a developer, my brain just goes, "Oh, I could build a two-bedroom apartment, let's say, for a million dollars and make maybe four or five thousand a month, or I can spend forty thousand dollars and make eight thousand a month." Yeah. It's a no-brainer, right? And so what your solution is doing is pretty unbelievable. Also, it's like this pickleball model, similar in the sense of low cost high yield but the the intangible is it's solving the homeless or not the homeless the housing the housing issue at large yeah. in a very efficient manner which developers love yeah um, well this it is makes, yeah. glamping or short-term rentals yeah no you brainer. can re literally you know put a small place and their rental rates for those are you know three hundred dollars a night yeah <laughs> so yeah. you can spend like forty fifty thousand dollars you can get your money back in like three years yeah and the other beauty of this, of our unit, is after you, 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 you don't even have to buy some property. You can install it, and then th three years <laughs> later, move it. pick it up and move it somewhere else. <laughs> so we've been talking to some cities and counties about using our units for the homeless, right? So Yeah. Yeah, how are those discussions going? Yeah, they're, they're going, they're, what, we have over 60,000 homeless in L.A. County. Uh, the new mayor wants to put 17,000 units in a year. I mean, you cannot do it traditional ways. You have to look at solutions like ours. And then you say, well, where are the properties, right? right. Well, there are many properties that uh, might be, well, you know, LAX owns property. Maybe it's under their, you know, under their runway, <laughs> I mean, under a flightway, but, you know, it's property. There are, there are some schools uh, around LA that might be closing. They, they are, they sell large properties. So you could, again, use our units they're, they look nice so that neighbors will not be opposed as to some of these uh, right. 
let cheaper versions. And then 10 years down the road, if demographics change, the school can get back in business, you could move our unit somewhere else. So, yeah, no, we're getting lots of interest. And do you have a waiting list at this stage? What's the... Yeah, I mean, we literally, as we talked before, we, we've done no advertising. I mean, it's all been through social media. And so we really are attracted. A lot of early adopters who follow YouTube channels about yeah. uh, some tiny homes and ADUs and, and small homes. Yeah, for the first couple of months, we're totally booked. But now we have some openings because okay. now people are knowing that they yeah. know that we're about to start printing so they're now going for permits so there's going to be openings so on one hand we kind of have a year worth of orders pre you can pre-order right you can go to your website and pre-order okay pre-order them yeah but but we have an opening I and mean, if somebody uh, somebody just on friday bought uh, two of these studios to go to nashville uh, to use for office i mean they have a uh, office building but they just love them to have a couple offices yeah. you know and do you guys offer financing of any kind yeah, or? we have on our website we have a link okay. to a finance company, and then we work with a number of, for ADU specifically a number of mortgage brokers who specialize in ADU financing. Okay. okay. So it's not. It's so not there's ways of getting debt at yeah. reasonable prices. Yeah. I know. Last time we spoke, you're working on making them vertical also. So so stacking of these units. How close are we to doing that? How close are you to achieving that? Probably a year away. Okay. Um, I mean, again, we just have about a year worth of. Production, as I said, there, there are windows. You know, if somebody wanted to one, one unit in a couple of months, we can probably find a window for them to do. We're also you know, raising more equity so that we can have more printers, okay. so we can increase our capacity. But realistically, I, mean, I just had to say no to so many people who want them to be stackable. And, and we just need to focus. I mean, yeah. the idea for any one startup thing at a time, yeah. is, is to figure out your niche, focus, really get, get it down, get... The, you know, get deliveries, get production going smoothly. But the units were designed. I mean, again, we started thinking about them. I used to build two and three-story apartments. So we, in our head, know how to make them stackable. Okay. But all the approvals and extra it's things. It's a little different. Were, yeah, about, in about a year from now. Yeah. Do you have a dream project? Like something that you'd really love to be doing? Dream project is to take this globally. Uh, we're getting... It's pretty incredible how we get people excited from other parts of the globe. <laughs> uh, we have somebody coming from Canada in, in two weeks. They want to have distributorship for Canada. We have calls almost every week with somebody from Japan. Who's, the housing shortage and how, cost of housing is a global problem. And so, uh, you know, I don't necessarily have a dream project, a project that I would love to do, but I just I think our technology can be used for solving crises, like what's going on now in Turkey and Syria. There's mm -hmm. thousands of homes are being destroyed. Mm -hmm. Or Ukraine, where I'm from, you know, mm -hmm. one day that country is going to need to be rebuilt. Just to think again to doing a traditional way mm -hmm. just doesn't make sense. Uh, so I really, I, I'm um, more excited, than, excited about how to take our technology and use it to solve a housing shortage the yeah. housing problem yeah that's kind of more of a you know than the specific project that's probably a big enough market for the time being also so you can plant your flag on that all day yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know I, again i see a lot of other innovation and i'm hoping that our innovation will spur other people to come up with new ideas i know that we're not the only solution uh, the problem is so huge that there is going to be need for other solutions but it cannot be incremental I mean, you know, maybe in some other pl industries, you can make incremental change and reduce the cost a little bit or <laughs> improve the timing a little bit. With housing, there needs to be a radical change. Yeah. Do you have like a dream, a dream person to come walk your studio? Maybe like Elon, because he went to go see Boxable and maybe come see you? <laughs> I'm more, we have a lot of visitors, right? Yeah, of course. And I love when somebody comes in they're not a real estate developer. They're not necessarily a buyer. Yeah. But they come in and just, you can see their eyes they sparkle. Get it. Yeah. Sparkle. Yeah. And it's like, and most of it is just for their own use. Yeah, that's so uh, true. And for the people listening, if, if you can go on our YouTube channel, you go there and you can see some of the B-roll that we took uh, at the factory. Yeah. And you can kind of get a sense of what the sparkle that you're talking about and how, how it derives so quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, it's pretty incredible. Well, listen, where can people find you? Where can people buy your, the buy it, follow you, we'll give them all the good stuff? AzurePrintHomes.com. We're on every social media, and uh, yeah, we'd love to. We love to hear from people coming I mean, to a neighborhood near you. Well, Gina, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, brother. I'm excited for you and your company. Yeah. And uh, I love the problem you're attacking and how you're doing it. Well, so thank, thank you. Thanks for visiting us and sharing the, the, the first family work. duo, Stephen and his uncle Gene, right <laughs> here go. on our pod. <laughs> He's done very well. So. He's done well. <laughs> very, con- very proud of for him. For people listening to the modern animal, that's Stephen, that's Gene's nephew. Yeah. And uh, that, that episode did really, really well. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, brother. Thanks. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over 100 episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.